Psalms chapter 27. Psalms chapter 27 and verse 6. Go all the way to verse 6. Thank you so much. Let's all read together in unison. One, two, ready, go. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the... Let's read it one more time. Everybody go. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to our Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, I've got joy, 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 joy. For joy. Say, I've got joy, 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 joy. If they are frowning, ignore them. Turn to the other one and say, I've got joy. For joys. I've got joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the joy of your presence. We are grateful that we get to partake, to feast on this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Let's just celebrate the worship team. And especially, let's celebrate Minister Niela. Niela has been here for two Sundays. How many of you are here for worship night on Friday? It was incredible. For those of you who are not here, um, the angels are marking asterisks on your name in the book. They're like, um, are you sure he wants to come to heaven? Don't mind me. Don't mind me. There are things that sometimes we, if you're not careful, you think are in the Bible. Things like when God closes a door, he opens a window. That's not in the Bible. Things like um, cleanliness is next to godliness. That's even as much as we want our kids to clean their rooms, that's not in the Bible. Things like God helps those who help themselves. The, 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 the modern rendition of that was actually coined by Benjamin Franklin, so it's not really in the Bible. Things like to thine own self be true, even though it sounds like King James. It's actually from a Shakespearean play. Um, things like money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6 verse 8, 10 actually says the love of money. So stop hating on money. Money is not evil. Money is just an amplifier. Money is a revealer of your heart. A pastor once said some people are still coming to church because they are still broke. When they get rich, we'll see if they really want to come to church. <laughs> All of a sudden, I have to be at the club. I have to be in Pari this weekend. Then, on the other hand, there are some other things that you would not believe are in the Bible. I have to keep this PG because there are some really crazy things in the Bible. But, but um, in the Bible, the Bible actually says in 2 Kings chapter 2 that Elijah was bald. And um, some of the kids, young people, were laughing at him for his baldness. And the Bible says he cursed them. And um, two bears, female bears, came out of the woods and killed 42 of them. I like how the Bible doesn't like want to be good. The Bible just says this the way it happened. That same Elijah, yep, he did this to 42 kids. Things like um, someone in Mark chapter 14, people actually believe is Mark, the writer of the book, because the person says someone. You know when you write a book and you don't want to out yourself, and then you say someone who worked with Jesus, the Bible says they caught him, and he had just a linen cloth around him. The Bible says he left the linen cloth with them and ran away naked. He did not want to be arrested with Jesus. That's how desperate he was. To be free. The Bible says he ran away naked. That's in the Bible. That's, we don't talk about that part, you know what I mean? Because everybody does, nobody wants to out Mark. Everybody, I think it's Mark because it said someone. If it was Peter who did that, he would have said, and Peter left naked. <laughs> but he said a certain young man. <laughs> One other thing in the Bible that I don't quite, I, don't, I, I struggle with is found in Luke chapter 17 verse 1. The Bible says Jesus said to his disciples, Offenses will certainly come. The Passion Translation says, One day, Jesus taught his disciples this. Betrayals are inevitable. I, 
He says it twice. Matthew chapter 18 verse 17 says, hard times are inevitable. The Passion Translation says, troubles and obstacles to your faith are inevitable. So not only does Jesus guarantee that offenses are going to come, he turns around and James tells us how we are supposed to view those offenses. James chapter 1 and verse 2 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. The message translation says, consider it a shared gift. I grew up in a time when your parents would discipline you or spank you and then require you to smile at the same time. Like that's the era I grew up. Nowadays, you can't do that so you don't get arrested. You know what I mean? But when I was growing up, you, you'd be hurt. And they'd be like, why are you crying? Then they'll say the universal, fix your face. (laughs) You're vibrating because you're holding all that. In our minds, we we killed our parents many times. (laughs) They're always saying, find the joy in the spanking. Well, it's, it's easy to laugh about that. It's difficult to really say it in practical terms because we have real problems. Our problems have problems. Our issues have issues. We are challenged on every side. Even if you don't have a problem, we are living in a world that is so inundated with issues and so polarizing that some of us have developed compassion fatigue to the point where you hear somebody has just died and you don't feel anything because all your feelings are gone. You're exhausted. Pay c- c- compassion. And it's incredible because even from, from babyhood, children come out of the womb and the first thing they do is just cry. Some babies are g- g- gangsters and they don't cry, but usually babies cry. Why? They draw the first breath and that expansion in their lungs causes so much pain, they cry. So everybody has problems. It takes more muscles, 50 muscles, to frown than 13 muscles to, to smile. But most of us frown more than we smile. Most of us has, have an RBF, resting B face. Like, <laughs> you just don't know how to smile. When they tell you smile, you're like, you don't know what to do. Your brain has not processed smile in a very long time because it's real. Anxiety rates are through the roof. Loneliness is through the roof. All kinds of mental disorders, all kinds of... We're just inundated with problems. And the weightiness of this displeasure has led us to erroneously label happiness as joy. Label relief as joy. Label label the temporary ease from the challenge as joy. Joy and happiness and not the same thing. Here is some contrast between the two. Joy is an internal decision or is an internal posture. Happiness is externally triggered. It's an externally triggered um, 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 feeling. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17 says this. Though the fig tree does not blossom and there are no fruits on the vine, though the yield of the olives fail and the fruit does not produce food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there are no cattle in the stall, yet I will choose to rejoice is a choice. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It's the result of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Happiness, on the other end, is just the, the result of an event, a person, or place. Joy is, is, context, is not contextual. It's not circumstantial. It's not based on what has happened. Happiness is solely based on what has happened. If you, if, if you, if you think about happiness, it's based on a circumstance. And it's, it's easy to choose happiness over joy because it's easy to outsource the trigger of your happiness. Pastor Vic, you will not understand. If you know what they did to me, you will know why I'm sad. If you know what they did to me, you will know why I'm upset. So we outsource the feelings that we do, but joy is an internal process, something you have to become. Happiness is something you do. 
Joy stems, the actions of joy stems from, they stem from the, the being of joy. It costs near nothing to be happy. Drink a c- c- cup of coffee, a cup of tea, you get happy. Watch a meme on TikTok, you get happy. And a friend comes to visit, you get happy. You get a raise, you get happy. It's very easy. But joy is a process that challenges you to change. Joy is a process that, 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 that makes it easier to just take the shortcut of just being happy. Uh, it's easier also to pretend to be happy. It's easier to fake happiness. Just smile. And people go, oh, you're so happy, go lucky. No, 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 no. Joy, you can't fake real joy. It's an overflow. It comes from the inside. So if we're not careful, most of us, what we have experienced up until now has been happiness instead of joy. If we're not careful, most of us here have never experienced what it means to really have joy. Most of us have just been happy all our lives. The challenge of joy is that joy tears you apart. Joy tears you apart. Let me me explain. Matthew chapter 26 verse 29, we see Jesus on his face. He came to the earth to die. He gets to the point just before they arrest him and he doesn't want to do again. He's like, I, I, if it's your will, let, let, let this cup, I don't, I don't want to do, I don't want to, it's a lot. A lot of pain, a lot of suffering, the worst day in human existence. I don't think I have it again. I don't want to. He says, well, you know what, but, but nevertheless, ne- nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's two realities he's contending with. There's pain, there's frustration. He's going to be hurt, but he also knows the will of God. So he says, nevertheless, um, Luke chapter 5 verse 5, Peter had fished all night, caught nothing. This is a pro fisherman. Caught nothing. Jesus goes and says, hey, put your net on the other side. He's like, bro, like you, you, are, you, are, you, you deal with wood, you're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. It doesn't work like that. Nevertheless, nevertheless, be, because you said so. Because you, so there's two realities I've tried as a professional. Pastor Vic, I've revised my resume as much as resumes can be revised, but God is faithful at the same time. So joy tears you apart. In Habakkuk, where we read that the fig tree is not blossoming, when you read from the beginning of the chapter, it's as if everything is good. And all of a sudden you realize that they're actually trying to have joy in a circumstance that was not good. They were choosing to respond. The fig tree is not blossoming. There's no fruit on the vine, no cattle. There's nothing that's supposed, where it's supposed to be. Yet, I choose to rejoice. That's, a, that's, a, that's the, is the, is the tear, the, the tear of yet. The pool of nevertheless. Yet means at the same time. But still, nevertheless, says there are two realities I'm faced with. I've tried all night, but I know you're faithful. I don't, I don't like the feeling of this. But I know you're faithful. I wish you were in the auditorium, but God has a better plan for us. It tears you apart. You have to face, on, face the two realities. Unlike happiness, where you get to choose what you want to respond to. I'm just going to ignore my problems for that. and just drink this bottle of, of wine real quick. Tomorrow I will deal with the problems. Happiness, you get the opportunity to, to choose. To pick what you want to respond to. But joy makes you consider the both of them. You have to consider the both of them. Everybody say, I've got joy. That means I can be sad and have joy. I can be in misery and have joy. I can cry and have joy. I can be in pain and have joy. I can be in discomfort and have joy. I can have sorrow because I loved, I lost a loved one and still have joy. I can scream at the top of my voice and still have joy. Because joy does not give me the, 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 the luxury of picking an option. Joy says I have to consider both instances, both realities. The, 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 the dictionary um, defines joy as an emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. They miss the whole point of joy when they say it's an emotion. Because joy is not an emotion. Joy is a decision. It's not a feeling. Pastor Rick Warren defines it as this. Joy is a settled assurance that God is in control of all the details in my life. It's a quiet confidence that ultimately everything will be all right. It's a determined choice 
To praise God in every circumstance. I just thought to add to that definition, joy is the evidence of the anticipation of hope. Joy is an expression of well-being in every situation. Joy is an exercise of faith and trust in God. Joy means I cannot, I cannot pick. I have to emote. I have to celebrate. I have to decide sometimes in, in ways that are in contrast to what I'm going through. It chooses to anchor on hope because joy cannot exist without hope. Joy is expressed because of the fundamental belief that things are going to get better than they are now. So joy needs hope. Hope is an expectation based on the awareness of an existing reality. A reality that is better than what I'm going through. I don't know if you've ever seen a baby, baby hurts themselves or a, a little child hurts themselves and then we just say, oh no, 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 we just smile, smile. We're getting them to smile even though they're in pain and they're like, they're like, turn! Because they're in pain. But they see you smiling and they want to, they want to do what you're doing. They want to mimic you. And they're like, but it hurts though, but mommy's smiling. Okay? Maybe it's not real. That, that's the real picture of joy. Joy doesn't say you have to pretend that everything is good. Joy just says you have hope that it gets better. That this is just a bus stop. And I don't have to get off this bus now. It's just a bus stop. The bus is going to keep going to the next place. Joy says that he, ha he has to have hope to be operational. Joy faces the situation, confronts the struggle. Happiness can be distracted from it. I was thinking that sadness was the opposite of joy until I realized sadness is the opposite of happiness. And sadness is not in the equation for joy because I can be sad and still have joy. The opposite for joy is despair, is hopelessness. I don't have joy when I cannot have hope. To have joy, I must have hope that something can get better. If we allow despair, if we allow the devil to, to, to choke our hearts, get a hold of our hearts and squeeze out the hope and we end up in despair, he has successfully attacked our joy. I'm laying all of this foundation because I need you to understand that, well, when we say we have fun, that's just a cool way of saying we choose joy. No matter what is going through, there's always going to be a smile on our face. Tears might be rolling down our eyes, but we're going to smile because our smile reflects the hope that we have that God can come true for us. If you believe that, put your hands together and celebrate God. <laughs> Joy says, I've seen this movie before and I know that even though the main character is being beaten up, John Wick has this, this knack for being beaten up, but in the end he kills everybody. It's one of those ones, unlike some other actors that don't get a bruise and they just kill everybody. John Wick is literally <laughs> shuffling to the last fight. But you watch it the second time and you're smiling because you know no matter how big down he is, he's going to come back again. Most of us have to have that picture. No matter how the circumstance looks right now, I'm coming back stronger. I'm coming back wiser. I'm coming back better. My life is turning around. And therefore, I have joy because I know how the story ends. In the end, I win. So at the end of the day, I was thinking, what, what, what are the postures of joy? What does joy do? The first thing is that joy... Number one, bows down. I was going to do this entire point bowing down. But if I bow down, most of you are not going to see me. Only the 11 people up front here are going to see me. Just imagine I'm bowing down. But Job is a wonderful example of this. The Bible says that Job is a good guy. Woke up every morning, sacrificed, worshipped. And then in one day, he heard the worst news of his life. He lost everything, including his kids. The Bible says in Job chapter 1 verse 20, Then Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head in mourning for his children, and then he fell to the ground and worshipped God. Two re 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 realities here. He got up, tore his robe, shaved his head in mourning. Two realities. And then he fell to the ground and worshipped the first posture of joy is that you're bowed down. That word there, worship, 
is sahar. It means to bow down. It means to prostrate yourself. It means to, to prostrate to a superior, to bow before God in worship. It means to depress. And as I was reading that and I read that definition, the Holy Spirit said, you can depress, but you cannot be depressed. Most of us pick the wrong expression of that. You can depress in worship, but what you cannot be is depressed in your feelings. You can go down in worship. You can bow down in worship. It's painful, but it's not hopeless. I just lost my job, but it's not hopeless. It's crushing. It's unbelievable, but it's not hopeless. He goes on to say, John chapter 1 verse 21, he said, Naked, without possessions, I came into the world from my mother's womb, and naked I will go back. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Verse 22, through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. That word there, blessed, reinforces the posture. Is the, the, the Hebrew word barak, which means to break your knee, to bow down. So he just says, Job just bows down. Why am I bowing down? I'm bowing down because I need to focus on the right thing. Most of us get a doctor's report, and the first thing you go is go to WebMD. To find out if you're dying. And there's usually death there as, as the complication. The last one is usually death. Begins with a headache, ends with death. Always. And the first thing we do is we, we, want, we want to see. No. Worship makes me focus on the right thing. I bow down because I want to be still and I want to remember. I bow down because I want to worship and I want to overcome the negative words in my mind. I want to overcome it with the promises of God. I bow down because I need to guard my heart because out of it flows the issues of my life. I want to guard it against the attack of the devil. I bow down and I worship because it keeps me in God's presence. You're going nowhere when you're bowed down. Your legs don't work when you're bowed down. You're planted in this place. Psalm chapter 16 verse 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me. He's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Verse, Psalm chapter 16 verse 8 says, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken for he's right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad. Not because the circumstance has changed, but because I've set the Lord before me. And I shall not be moved. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. And my body rests in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead. Nor allow your holy one. This is a prophecy about Christ. To rot in the grave. We'll get there. 11 says, you will show me the way of life. The way out of the circumstance. Granting me the joy of your presence. And the pleasures of living with you forever. Notice, this psalmist already begins to rejoice. And there is no re resolve. The pain is not gone away yet. The challenge has not yet been resolved. And he's saying, I rejoice. No wonder I'm glad. Because I've set in front of me God. Remember when I had the, the scare, I had the lump in my hand and I went to, to the doctors and he opened it up. After the ultrasound, we checked it. He was like, don't worry, it's going to be a cyst. It's going to be a, a lipoma. Opens it up. I'm a doctor. I'm a former doctor, trained doctor. And he knows that. So he opens up my arm. And then he sees the lump. Now, we're not doing scans. He's a trained doctor looking at the lump. I'm looking at it. He's looking at it. I'm looking at him like, bro, say something. He says, he's Indian. I love him. He says, um, now I'm worried. I say, you say, what? <laughs> now I'm worried. Vic, Vic, I'm, I'm really worried. I'm really worried. I think we need to go to real doctors. I say, um, what do you mean? <laughs> there are certificates on your wall. <laughs> so we have to go to real doctors. We have to go to John Hopkins. We have to, we have to figure this out. Da, 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 da. And he's just like, I'm really worried. Now we're going to take some of your muscles, some of your skin. We're going to have to do a graft. He's just talking. My hands are open in front of him. He's just going in. I'm like, I'm supposed to be the one losing my mind. Why are you losing your mind? He just, he lets his training go through. He did not care. I said, um, Doc, just cover my hand. Thank you. Just sit back. Thank you. He said, Amen, Vic, you didn't take this serious. I'm going to book the surgery, blah, blah, blah. He goes, Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's do that. Boom, boom, boom. I get to the car. Now, I'm not asking you to do this, married folk, but this is what I did. I knew I was going home to Pastor Ambi. And I know Pastor Ambi. Pastor Ambi loves me too much. And I sat in that car. I started a car. 
and I played this song. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, something, something, and I put my <laughs> faith in Jesus. He'll never let me down. And I played it. Faithful through every some season. For why would he fail now? He won't. Oh. And I played it over and over and over again. When I drove out of that parking spot, I was sure I did not have cancer. I was sure. I heard a pastor say once, the first five minutes after you hear bad news are the most important. It shapes how you respond. The end of the testimony, the surgery became optional. Like, do you want to do it? Because it's beginning to shrink. The doctors were like, we could have to do this. Man, it's shrinking. I said, no. Just take it out. Just, I, I, I don't want to deal with this anymore. That's where the story ended. But when I drove out to the park, you can ask Pastor Ambi. When I came home, she could not have guessed <laughs> what the doctor said. She couldn't have guessed. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just saying for me, because I needed to build up faith real quick. Real quick to withstand all. I'm a, a doctor, so I know everything my doctor said, I understood. And it's my right hand. I understood everything he meant. So I had very few minutes, not only to reset to zero, but to get to the positive. Very fast. Most of us just reset to zero every day. You don't build on any post. The word of God is how you do it. So the, 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 the joy bows down in worship. That's why you come to church on Sunday. At least get in a room where the sole focus is God. And it trains you to focus on God. Number two, joy stands tall. I don't know if you've seen these comp slap competitions now on Instagram where i am not seen the women do it here. Probably women do it, but I've just seen the men one. And then you hold on to <laughs> the table thing. And then another grown man. Like, this is why he beats me. It's the aiming. It's the... And you know the third one is coming for you. Like, you know, <laughs> and the challenge is to stand. Is after the slap. Can you stand? And then people just, there's one guy that they slapped. And my guy head first. He just, his brain was like, no, we're going down. The children of Israel in, in Egypt went through all kinds of assaults. Exodus chapter 14 says, and Pharaoh, finally, they, 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 they're released. God does wonders, 10 plagues and everything. They are released. They are going into freedom. They are happy. They are singing and everything. Next thing they look back, Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. Pharaoh is approaching the children of Israel. Look up and they are panicked when they saw the, the, the Egyptians coming, overtaking them. And they cried out to God and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen? When people say, I told you this was going to happen when something bad happens. Why did we stay in Egypt? Leave us alone. Let us be slaves. These are the same people who were crying out to God. God actually called Moses because of their cry. He said, I've heard the cry of the people. But things look bad now and you're forgetting how bad they were before. He says, we should have left us there. It is better to be a slave in Egypt than cops in the wilderness. First five minutes. Note this, verse 13. Moses says to the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still. Stand still and watch God rescue you today. The Egyptians you see, you will not see them today. You will not see them again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stand still. That word there means to take place, to set, to stand, to station oneself. Just, most of us do too much. You do too much. You hear bad news and you're already like, ah, you're already, go and, go and sleep. Go and sleep, just take a nap. Sleep. If you cannot sleep, that's where the problem is already. So I, so I, I can power nap. And it's not because I'm a better Christian. No. That whole cast your cares upon Jesus thing, I take it very seriously. 
want something. Ask Pastor Ambi. I just got in the hot afternoon, 1 p.m. I just get an email I don't like. Okay, to bed it is. So we're going. <laughs> no, she'll tell you, I just go and sleep. I don't know. I'm one of those men. I will tell you, I don't know. If I don't know, I don't know. I, 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 I get time. Give me time to go sleep and then go pray. But why do I sleep? So I can shut off my mind. Just stand still. It reminds me of a story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Jehoshaphat was faced with an army, massive army. Two, three countries came after him. 2 Corinthians chapter 20, all the way to 16, they, they prayed to God, what should we do? They bow down and they prayed to God, what should we do? And then they get an instruction. The instruction was, tomorrow, go down against them. This will surely come up. And they will surely come up by the accent of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the brook by the wilderness of Jeruel. And you will not need to fight this battle. The reason why most of us are stuck is because you get into a battle you were not supposed to fight in the first place. I went on vacation after the doctor's diagnosis. And Pastor Ambi went to Mexico for five days. Guess when the surgery was? In the middle of the vacation. <laughs> Guess what I did? Move the surgery. Yeah. Do you know why? I had a series already planned to preach. I'm not going to die anytime soon. <laughs> there are things God showed me. It's that building we are going to. We are going to have a building, you know? And it's, I'm going to see it. No, I'm going to preach in that building. So I'm, I'm not going to die. Like, it's not because I'm a pastor. It's not about being a pastor. It's just confidence. I'm, God will not show me something he doesn't want to give me. Understand? The reason why Moses is not getting to the promised land is because he, he did something wrong. As long as I'm fooling God and I, by the help of the Holy Spirit obeying him, whatever he showed me, I'm going to step into like, can make me a promise. That's different. When I hear a promise, that's different. What he showed me when I see, I see myself in it. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get into it. That's right. Went off, I moved it. I said, doctor, moved it. He said, you're not taking this serious. I'm taking it serious. But more serious, more serious. is my vacation yeah. with my wife. <laughs> Ask her. We're there. Ask her if I look like somebody who... I didn't, I didn't care. I do not... Uh. <laughs> Verse 17 of the Second Corinthians 20 says... You will not need to fight. Position yourself. Stand still and see. That same word is used. Stand still and see the salvation of God. Do not be afraid or dismayed. For tomorrow you go up against them. For the Lord is with you. And the Bible said, Jehoshaphat did what? He bowed his head to the ground. And all of Judah bowed before the Lord. And they worshipped the same word as the word in Job. And they worshipped you will bow to every challenge if you don't bow to God first. If you, don't, if you don't bow to God first, you will succumb to every challenge. Let me advise you. Do not set yourself against any opposition if you've not set yourself before God. No matter how urgent it is, it's not that serious. Even the more urgent it is, the more urgently you should run to God. Stop everything and just go somewhere and just worship God. Worship focuses your mind on the faithfulness because you don't have, God doesn't have to do anything for you to worship. That's praise. Worship focuses your mind on who God is. You stand tall. The Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1, Habakkuk had questions. He said, I will climb up to my watchtower and there I will stand. That's the same word. I will stand tall. I will stand still. I will not just go fight. I will fight the urge to respond. Somebody says something about your social media and you're like, give me one minute. And you're ready. You're going. You're typing response. Drop your phone. Just breathe. Somebody emails you and then you, you, you type, I spare my last email. Like, Relax. I spent the last conversation I had. Just, just relax. Just drink some cold water and, and calm down. Sometimes you don't need to respond. I've been in circumstances that resolve themselves as I stand still. It comes and then the, the answer comes. I'm, I'm just there looking at all of it happen. Stand still. Everybody say stand still. Say I'm going to stand still. Because my standing reveals my confidence in the one who is backing me. My standing still doesn't mean I'm, 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 I'm naive of how difficult things are. It just means I'm confident 
that I'm going to get a download of what I'm supposed to do. Because you cannot download from God being all anxious. Most of us have made mistakes. Some, some of us are suffering the consequence of acting rashly. Not even the consequence of the thing. Is that you acted too fast. Now you have so much to roll back. So joy bows down. Joy stands tall. And joy speaks up. Joy speaks up. Let's get back to King Jehoshaphat. He's faced by a mighty army. They downloaded instruction to stand still and watch God work. They bow down in worship. They go to bed that night. They say, tomorrow, that's when the fight is going. Just imagine how God works. There's an army facing you. The army is coming. God tells you the first word in God's revelation is tomorrow. You say, what? <laughs> tomorrow. What, what do you mean? But they're coming now. Tomorrow. Uh -huh. that's good. Most of all, that's all you need to hear today. I know you want to send email now. Check. You want to send out every. You want to do something after church. But tomorrow. Why? Go to bed. Your sound sleep is an evidence of your trust in God. Everybody say tomorrow. 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 Say tomorrow. When tomorrow comes, this is what I want you to do. Guess what they do when they realize? Oh, we're not going to have to fight. Oh, since we're not going to have to fight. We're going to be spectators to this fight. Why don't we add one more layer to our joy? Verse 22 of 2 Corinthians 20 says this. Now, when they began to sing and to praise. So since we're not fighting, let's do something fun while we're watching them kill themselves. So let's begin to sing. The Bible says, as they were singing and as they were praising, the Lord himself... Set ambush against the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who came against Judah and they were defeated. They didn't fight. God did all the work. Most of us are trying too hard and not going to bed and not waiting till tomorrow. Not knowing God wants to give the dream that is going to release what you need this night. And he's saying, can you just go to bed? Can I have a chance to, to talk to that person so they can give it to you? And we're all anxious. But what did they do? Not only did they bow down, not only did they stand still, the Bible said that they sang. That word there, is, 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 it means, is, a, is a Hebrew word that means a creaking, the shrinking, is a ringing sound of joy, of gladness, of proclamation. Joy speaks. Joy is not passive. Joy is seen in speech. Joy is hopeful. Joy speaks in expectation. Joy does not just curse everybody out. Because if you're cursing everybody out, you can't tell me you have joy. Because I can tell the level of your joy by what you're saying. But this is how it's always going to be. In our family, this is how it is. In the fall, I always fall sick. That is not the language of joy. Joy is expectation. Joy is hopeful. Joy is faith-filled. Second case, chapter 4, we see Elisha prays for a woman. The woman gives birth to a son. The son dies. The woman is on her way to inform the prophet that the son has died. Takes the son, puts the son in the room of the prophet. Goes, goes on to look for, for the prophet. And she goes, she meets the servant of the prophet. Because the prophet sees the woman coming with intention. Like, um, um, mm. Okay, you go and find out why she's coming. You know how very serious she can be. No, say, no. what's happening? Is everything okay? Everything is well. It's well. It's well. What? It's well. It's well. Okay, then he runs back and she, she said, It's well. Nah, that face. That, mm -mm. Go back and ask her. She says, It is well the entire time with a dead son because joy speaks the language of hope, joy speaks the language of faith. Joy speaks the language that expresses the reality I choose to hold as the main reality. It expresses my most dominant reality. It doesn't ignore the other one. It just says, I choose to make this the principal reality. I choose the fact that God is faithful over the fact I don't have a job yet and no one is interviewing. I choose the fact that God is faithful. Even though my marriage looks like what it is now. I choose the fact that God is faithful. I choose to act like God is faithful. We're driving down on 200 when we got the phone calls from our leaders. Hey, we cannot use the auditorium. You, you would not have believed after the phone call that we got that call. The same way the car was when we got the call, after the call, is the same way the car. I pass me. Just kept driving. I was still looking look at my notes for preaching. You wouldn't have believed. Joe was sleeping at the back. No, you would not have believed that we just got a call that changed our entire Sunday. Why? Instantly we chose. It's going to be a great Sunday. 
No matter what we have to do, we're going to do what we have to do. We'll be fine. All the calls I said, nobody, you don't hear panic. Not because I'm not freaking out in a particular reality like, oh, the last time we were in the cafe, we, we were not as big as we are now. But nah, it's in that place that somebody on a Sunday that rents out chairs was awake to pick up the call. <laughs> Do you understand? No panic. God has already set a ram. Set alternate, like, oh, oh, they're going to use cafe. And they don't know, don't they? Okay, you call. Awesome. Now you know, prepare. Call this other vendor. They are awake. Hey, wake up. Why am I awake? Wake up. The call comes. Awesome. Can you d- deliver before 10? I, I, I can do maybe 10, 11. We'll pay you more if you deliver before 10. Oh, yes. <laughs> deliver before 10. <laughs> because joy speaks up. It's going to be a great Sunday. It's going to be good. My, my marriage is going to be great. Joy doesn't keep quiet. Joy talks. I'm going to end with this story. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 6, verse 5, the Bible says they had come to the wall of Jericho. Verse 5 says, and it shall come to pass. This is God telling Joshua that when they make a loud blast of the ram's horn and when they hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. That word is the word joy in Psalms chapter 27 that we read. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies and I shall offer the sacrifices of joy. That word joy there is not gladness. That Hebrew word for joy in sacrifices of joy is an alarm of war. A war cry. A battle cry. A shout, a blast of war, especially of trumpets. So when he was saying... Give a loud shout. It was not empty. It was a shout of joy as if they were already in the promised land. And not only was it a shout of joy as if they were already in, it was a shout of war. So even though they had no swords and they had no nothing, they were just there walking around. They were like, oh, war is about to happen. You guys don't know, but we've just released an alarm that tells heaven it's time for me, for you to intervene. Guess who? They did not push the wall down. All they did was shout. Because my joy triggers heaven to act on my behalf. When I shout for joy, it says, God, I'm ready for you to do what only you can do. So at the well, we're going to be known for joy. When things get very difficult, we'll shout for joy. When things get very hard, we're gonna say it's gonna be a wonderful day today. You're gonna to see us smiling. Why? Because we are hopeful of a God that comes true. When they give you that diagnosis, just begin to smile. Don't be like, why are you smiling? Because this is just an opportunity for great joy. He said, when I go through diverse circumstances, consider it an opportunity for great joy. This is an opportunity for great. What do you mean? It's an opportunity for me to have joy because without this, there will not be an opportunity for me to have joy. I just lost my job. <laughs> I just lost my job. Why? It's an opportunity for me to have great joy because I can see God do the miraculous. If I had the job, I cannot experience the miraculous. So I lose the job so I can see God flex for me. So you're going through something, you choose joy. If you have to scream, yes, it's okay to scream out of the pain. Just lost someone you love. But make sure you fully it up with a scream. God is faithful. I don't feel it right now, but I know it in my heart that God is faithful. I know that God will not leave me to die here. God will not leave me to suffer I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. No matter, I don't care that there's no money. He fed a a human being with ravens. Ravens pluck out the eyes of human beings. He sends food. Do you not understand the miracle? The miracle is bread, bread, birds, bread. Think about it. We feed birds with bread. They held that bread in their mouth for that long. Who knows if they were hungry? One of them was like, man, should we eat this bread? Man, that bread is not for you, man. It's for It's for the prophet. And the, and the birds held it and came and perched. And be like, okay, so this is the first one. You drop your own. Second one. Do you want anything more? Want more bread. Welcome in. The miracle is in the precision of God. To locate a man that was hiding. For birds to have a global divine positioning system to track down a man 
Not just any man. Somebody owns this miracle. And God is going to deliver it however way he sees fit. Through the boss that op oppresses you. Through the person that's been hating on you. He will reveal and he will deliver your miracle through the most unusual places. That's why I have joy. Because I get to see how is God going to solve this one. Let me see how, how good he's going to work this one out. So we choose joy. So this morning I want to invite you to a house party of joy. It doesn't mean I'm not going to have pain. It doesn't mean I'm going, to, I'm going to be frustrated. It just means even in my frustration, I'm going to find a way to have joy. If you believe that God is about to work in your life like never before, put your hands together and celebrate. Let's just give him a shout. This is not a time to pray. Why don't we give him a shout of joy that tells heaven, I don't know why you're sitting. If I were you, I would shout like I'm in front of Jericho's walls. Telling heaven, I'm ready for you to intervene. I'm ready for you to intervene in my finances. Lift up your voice and begin to shout. Say, Lord, I'm ready for you to come true for me. This diagnosis, I'm ready for you to come true. I'm ready for you to come true. Thank you, Jesus.